Uh, thank you so much to, for uh, having me. Uh, thanks to Derek and Chris. Um, hi. So uh, the talk is called The Hardest Part of Running uh, Social Sector Design Institute Isn't What You Think. It sounds very buzzfeedy, I know, but I thought it would be the best way to kind of open up. Uh, also, just a quick note, this is not a technical talk, so you may leave at any time. I would be uh, okay with that. I wouldn't be offended if you had to leave because of the lack of wonkiness and the lack of code that we could describe. Um, so like I said, my name is George A. I'm the co-founder and principal of Greater Good Studio. We're based up in Logan Square, and we've been really fortunate in the last five years to be able to find uh, a number of clients and projects that allow us to uh, use design in a very particular kind of way. We say that our mission is to work with folks on a mission, and uh, like I said, there's been a surprisingly large amount of appetite here in Chicago and uh, across the country now, uh, working with nonprofits, uh, local and uh, possibly some federal funding, uh, federal government work, as well as uh, foundations and some philanthropic um, uh, organizations, including a little uh, social enterprise here and there. Just to help you understand a little bit of my journey, um, I originally started my career as a design consultant at IDEO uh, in the Chicago office. And at IDEO, I was able to uh, experience an enormous range of different types of projects in the commercial design sector. And it's, um, it was, I think for me, a really uh, fortunate and very special time for me because I, I would say it probably formed a huge part of my worldview now. Um, there is a component of working at IDEO, though, which is to work on any project that, um, that comes our door uh, and working exclusively with a very small percentage of the world, uh, mostly people who can afford IDEO's rates. So uh, after about seven years of working at IDEO, I left the coolest design studio I could find and find the largest bureaucracy I could find in the city, which was the CTA, uh, where I was designing a 60-foot bus uh, for bus rapid transit in the city. It was awesome. Uh, it was a lot like building a large, large Lego set. Um, I also don't know if I realized at the time uh, how short that tenure would be, uh, because after 11 months, I got, uh, got given the boot. And uh, I'll just keep going. Um, <laughs> left after realizing the political nature of working at CTA is very, very challenging. Um, and I found myself uh, a new home at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, where I've been um, teaching full time for the last five years. It's only actually just a, a bit in January that I left the tenure track, and I'm now back at the studio full time. So I'm now at the studio. I now work uh, every day, which is great. I, I actually get a paycheck, which is so great. Um, and I'm at the studio, uh, and it feels very much like I'm connected back to the thing that we started a long time ago. Um, we say that we use design to improve the lives of people in need. So we call ourselves Greater Good Studio because we think very much about how design can be used in a different way than I'd been trained, which was to use it for whoever could afford it. And as opposed to maybe think about how design could be used for people who need it, uh, we use design in two different ways. One is we say we add capacity through the completion of our research and design projects. So we do a lot of human-centered design projects uh, for our clients. And another way is to build capacity through the training and coaching of people uh, in design, where the teaching capacity that we've, you know, we've built up over time, uh, we employ with our, with our clients. And we actually find that there are times with certain clients where we'll kind of go in these loops between adding capacity and then building capacity and then going back again. Uh, and we've been finding that sort of dual nature of teaching and using design has been one of the ways in which we may kind of build a business. I want to give a couple of examples of the kinds of technology projects we have done. So some of them will be experience projects, some will be training, and some will be actually uh, pretty heavy in technology. Uh, one here is called Squared Away Chicago. This was for the Metropolitan Tenants Organization. Uh, I don't know if anybody here is a renter. Can I see actually how many renters are here? Um, oh, there's a lot. Of all the people, actually, could you leave your hands up? Of all the people who are renters, how many here have awesome relationships with their landlords? Could you leave your hand up? You guys are very lucky. So for everybody who, who may not have a great relationship, um, you may need, unfortunately, a service like this. So the Metropolitan Tenants Organization has been defending tenants' rights uh, against wayward landlords for over 20 years. And they came to us with some help towards maybe digitizing some of their services, which has primarily been a uh, phone center um, for dealing with calls that are usually very distressed tenants trying to work out what the hell to do with their, um, with their eviction notice. So if you need help, um, squaredawaychicago.com uh, has been providing a new channel for the MTO's work with around tenants. Um, another project for us, which was very exciting, was to work with the JTDC, that's the Juvenile Temporary Detention Center here in Chicago, uh, funded through the work by uh, the Trust, uh, is around reducing recidivism in young people. So we have a website now that's called getdrive.org, which had the, the dual challenge of not only being uh, designed and, and coded by us, 
but also delivered onto USB drives, almost like smuggled in, not quite smuggled in, but physically had to get copied onto a thousand USB drives because the computers inside the JTDC do not connect to the internet. So if you have a website that's built for youth that cannot be accessed by youth in the jail that we designed it for, you've got to get it in there somehow. So we uh, built a thousand USB drives and had to get them uh, shipped in. So you can, if you leave the JTDC, now you get one of these drives every week, uh, you'll leave and there's about 120 kids every week leaving uh, the JTDC. And the uh, hope is that either they get it on the drive by hand, uh, they use the drive on a computer that may or may not have internet access. And if they do have the fortunate reality of maybe being able to afford a data plan, they can then access the website as you would normally expect at getdrive.org. So if you're looking for resources or if you know someone or yourself have a, um, are looking to maybe clear their record, get back into school or look for other support services, getdrive.org is a great place to do that. Skillchamp, which is an iPad app that we've been uh, fortunate enough to work with with a client called Infiniteach. This is one of the few social enterprises that we got to work with. Um, I'd say that we were uh, helpful in their application into getting into Impact Engine. How many people here actually know Impact Engine? They're a Chicago-based, um, there's a few. It's a really fantastic place. It's a Chicago-based uh, social impact investor um, and incubator. So they helped a lot of uh, nonprofits. Actually, uh, Ed, no Ed, Ed Ovo, Edovo, which used to be called Jail Ed Education Systems, is another uh, a, a part of the alumni of that uh, of, of those cohorts. Uh, so, if you're interested in doing or working within a, um, a social enterprise that's technology-based, uh, the Impact Engine is a great hub for that kind of activity. Uh, we helped them, uh, Infinity Teach, that is, design uh, their app. That was a native app for the iPad uh, for uh, kids along the autism spectrum to help youth as well as the uh, uh, teachers and parents uh, better understand sort of the connectivity around the data that's been collected uh, on this app so that it can be shared in a much more cohesive and holistic loop. And then lastly, uh, ChicagoWearsCondoms.com right now is a holding site for, um, it was made by a, um, I think a pro bono marketing firm but that domain name is going to be slowly converted, slowly, slowly converted by the folks over at Smart Chicago to become the new app that we've been helping uh, the Chicago Department of Public Health on around getting free access to resources for youth around sexual health. Um, what that means is that there's a, there will be a canonical database of um, locations to get free condoms in the city down to the level where you can find out from this app um, which aisle uh, to go to so you don't have to ask anybody where condoms are because it can be a huge barrier to find out where exactly I need to go if I have to ask someone who might rat me out later on or tell my mum. I can't imagine that kind of, uh, how awkward that would be. I never told my parents about sex, so I can imagine some of that. Um, so ChicagoWasteCondoms.com will eventually become this site to host that kind of data. Uh, that's different than the one if you were to look at it right now. So the reason I say all this is just to kind of ground uh, you guys in the kind of work that we do that has some technology aspects. Um, and I think from, for our sake, when we started in uh, 2011, uh, like I said here, when we first started the studio, we thought the primary challenge would be in finding paying clients because we are a professional you know, services firm. It's hard enough to get paid in professional services regardless of uh, the social sector you're in. But in the social sector, it's particularly hard because historically, not many people get funded for innovation work. Uh, the nonprofit sector has sort of like an aura of being a little bit broke and it's kind of true at times. Um, and we've met, we've been very fortunate to meet some folks who have had some funding, and in many cases we help them go find their funding, but it's not as though they're dripping in cash. Uh, so the initial thought of maybe having to um, uh, find playing kinds, I thought was gonna be top of mind forever. I wouldn't say it's like disappeared. I think business development is still a bit of a challenge, but there's been new challenges that we've started to face that came as a bit of a surprise that I wanted to share with you guys. Challenge number one. How do we build a world-class team? So it turns out that uh, our ability to be able to do world-class work only happens if we have world-class staff. Um, and because this space is very new, we feel like a kind of a responsibility to build this world-class team for ourselves because in many cases, our clients have maybe never worked with a designer ever. Um, they may not have really considered design. They may not have ever really worked in professional services. They've never really been a client before. So if we feel a certain responsibility kind of, kind of be like the grown-ups and some of them be like the representative design, which I don't think we expect it to be, but feel like a certain honor to maybe broker design for, for, for a lot of our clients in the first place. Uh, there's also a bit of a phenomenon, I'd say, in that design in the social sector seems to get a bit of a pass. 
Does anybody know what I mean? If you've ever done code for a nonprofit, sometimes they almost just say, whatever you give them will be fine, like, it's okay. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Has anyone ever felt like they got, not either they got given a pass, but rather the barrier, like the, the bar you were hitting wasn't necessarily the highest. Um, I think that's a phenomenon that we face a lot of the time, and I think it's kind of, that's kind of rough. Uh, and I feel like the only people maybe getting us to work higher maybe have to be ourselves, and I think that's probably something that motivates all of you. But it's tough when you don't feel like you have that like, huge motivating competitive uh, group that you may be working against. And I think that if we um, get better, we'll only get better if we keep using the bar that is set by us by maybe these other, bar these other sort of sectors, like the commercial sector. Um, so. When we look for applicants, um, we find that uh, people applying for the jobs that we have in, in our roles tend to fall into two kinds, of, two kinds of camps, and they're both very extreme. So on one end, we have people who are just angry, okay? Who are people who are sort of um, just upset with the world, and rightly so, because there's a lot of things to be kind of upset about. And while I recognize that sort of the civil rights movement, which was built, really primarily built around uh, a sense of outrage around sort of how things had to be different, that is a place for that kind of work, and I feel like we have not done. I don't think I could. I, could, I don't think I could pick it. I don't think I have the balls to be able to do that kind of work. But I do recognise sort of the role it's played. Um, we also have different kinds of applicants who are on the other side, who are completely naive, and there many of them are designers. They think that they're coming out of design school and maybe having done a project here and there means that they can now change the world like like that. And uh, in doing so, uh, we have a challenge where we say. That's a great project and all, but I think you're going to be surprised at just how hard this actually is going to be, how to, causing behavior change is going to be maybe harder and a lot, less mess, a lot messier than how you've neatly framed your project right now. So in between these two extremes, we think we've been trying to look for something, something different. Uh, so rather than sort of describing these two opposites of what we don't want, we try to reframe it and try and see if we can come up with something that describes who we are looking for. And we call these people pissed off optimists. <laughs> So our, our studio, I think, is made up of those folks. I feel like I'm one. I think, actually, there's probably quite a number of you in the room that would describe yourself as a pissed-off optimist who has that balancing act of being upset enough to know that something should be different, but maybe not you know, striking or, or picketing. And they're not so optimistic to think that they can do everything, but know that if we don't try, nothing will change. So being a pissed-off optimist describes our team, I think, to a T. Um, and I think it helps us be a little more strategic and a little more subversive around how we can make change. Uh, because we do think that being optimistic and particularly in design helps you do things differently because we make stuff. And I think many of you in the room know what the joy is of making stuff. When you make stuff that's real and tangible, I think people tend not to ignore it as, much, as hard, uh, as easily, sorry. Uh, so we think that sort of that balancing is, is, is very challenging. But I think that when we find people who are that perfect balance of pissed off optimist, uh, they find a, a lot of alignment in our, in, our, in our studio. Challenge number two, how do we maintain a sustainable business? So that's a little different than just getting a business and maybe starting it and maybe even being in business, but being sustainable I think is also really, really hard. Uh, so I want to maybe explain how, um, how that works because if we, if we had just described having this world-class team, world-class teams tend to require world-class salaries. They want to not be given a pass. Like it might be fine for us to be given a pass on like, oh, that's a cute piece of work. But if you don't get paid for it, the whole thing stops very, very quickly. Um, so we found that in many of our um, sort of traditional approaches to consulting, there have been one of two kind of reactions. One is, if you don't have money, I'm sorry, we can't work with you. That, uh, like it, the whole conversation kind of comes to a grinding halt very, very quickly. So professional services typically has to have payment. Otherwise, they just don't work for uh, work with a lot of nonprofit clients. On the other hand, and maybe some of you might relate to this as, too, as well, we have this other reaction, which is, we love you guys, this is great, we have a small team that isn't busy right now, let's organize a weekend hackathon and we're gonna do our very best to kind of help you guys out and we'll bust our ass on getting this, this piece of work done. And thanks very much, and we're done. So once the hackathon is done, people go back to their regular jobs and go back to their regular lives. And the non-profit client is sort of left with this thing that they that hopefully will become impactful and hopefully will have long-term change. I think both reactions, I think, are very understandable. And I think there's a lot of value that can come from a hackathon in a surprisingly short amount of time. But I think that both are hard to make sustainable. I think if every business did a hackathon every single weekend, that may be tough. I don't know how many weekends you want to spend sweating with your other sweaty friends, but you, know, you might want to have a regular life again. So I can understand why both exist. 
What we've often found, and this is a visualization, is that typically the relationship is to have a, consulting, a consultant on the one side and then our clients who have power and the money and all of the decision-making power on one side. We end up kind of on either side of a table and end up sort of negotiating over the scope of work and then maybe payment. The thing is, our clients don't tend to have that guy. Okay? Mm -hmm. They tend to should be just guys that want to have work happen. They don't necessarily have the cash with it, which makes it kind of awkward, but also awesome because we no longer are negotiating over decisions in the same way. We're kind of like now, kind of like buddies, which is great. We're like BFFs with our clients because there's a third party that steps in here, which is typically the funder, who then has the money, not necessarily the power, just money to fund the project, which means that we are now on the same side of the table, which before in our regular consulting, we might not have been. This three-way relationship is totally new. And it, for us, I wasn't having that much, I didn't really have that much experience with these sort of um, triangular, uh, triangulated relationships. It was very, very binary before. But in this triangle format, I feel a lot more alignment and kinship with our, with our clients than I think we had before. And the negotiation over just the money part uh, is handled together, client and ourselves, with the funder which is a very, very different relationship than I think we'd had before. So that's been one of the ways in which we found that by being sustainable, you can do so in this manner of kind of partnering up with your clients in a way that perhaps felt different before. Last one, almost there. How do we align our work with our values? So for me growing up, um, I think I'd always assumed that there were sort of two general models for how to have value and alignment and also uh, uh, provide value in, in uh, sorry, have alignment of the values of your work in your work. I thought one was to just become incredibly rich somehow. And then when you become incredibly rich, you give back to the community. And that you give back in a philanthropic way, or you spend your weekends, or you do some sort of giving. There's like this notion of like earn, learn, no, learn, earn, return. Has anyone ever heard of that? I think it's something that rich people tell each other. Uh, I, I'm not familiar with that term because I, I can't remember it, but I think that's what people, rich people tell each other to do. Uh, but in doing so, you eventually do that returning part because you have learned your skills, earned an enormous amount of money, and then are giving back. That takes a very long time. Uh, and also, not everybody decides to do that because they may not feel like they've earned enough to be able to give, give something spare. So that's, that's one approach. The other approach I've seen or sort of understood was to um, work in nonprofits and basically not earn very much and live on ramen noodles most evenings. I love ramen noodles, don't get me wrong, I think they're fantastic, but it's very challenging to have raise a family, buy a house, settle in, maybe send your kids to a school that you would like, all those things that sort of come with perhaps doing this side, but also feeling like it's aligned with your values. So I feel like we're kind of stuck. So we have something at the studio that helps us choose our clients very, very carefully because we are committed to aligning our values with the work that we do. And we call it the gut check. Um, a lot of our work, you see, used to come through when we were early on where we would field incoming calls and we'd be really excited about everybody that came in. And occasionally we'd go, I don't know, I don't feel right about that client. And I'd say, oh, I'm not sure about that project. And it was very literally just my gut telling me what to say or my co-founder's gut saying, oh, I don't know what it is. And we realized that's not a very sustainable way to run a business. You can't just keep using what my, what my physiological you know, intestine is doing for my business. That's like a terrible idea. But to formalize it, we realized we need to have a, a rigorous set of questions as to why my gut, or my intestines in this case, is actually feeling this way. Um, so we ended up doing this, this thing. Um, let's see if it'll play. So we have a, a survey now that we basically have to fill out uh, with every incoming call to see the kinds of relationships that we want to have with our clients. Um, everything from sort of, do we feel like there is going to be positive impact? Is there alignment between the profit goals of the client and us? Is this a good use of human-centered design? Do they like us? Do they value our work? Do they seem personally invested? Do we respect the client team? Have they expressed an interest in learning from us? Um, will this work hit the world? Have they proven impact? Is there opportunity for innovation? Uh, now, for us, growth is a firm, so there's a few questions about actual like profit. Will it actually make us money? Will we be proud of it? Will it leave more work? Could it influence others? Then the tiebreaker, are they hot or not? Because there's so much seriousness. Oh my God, it's such a serious topic area. When we're talking about recidivism or like mental illness or all these different areas. We just had to have a little uh, uh, levity. But 
our clients may come to us with all, any number of different projects, from Rob Wood Johnson with, uh, with the healthcare project around um, uh, the health of America, uh, or uh, Chicago Department of Public Health around, public, uh, around uh, teenagers and their sexual habits. And in every case, we have to make sure it's not about our clients and about the projects uh, you know, in, in, in themselves, but around how they are engaging with us as a firm. And I think by formalizing and rigorously vetting our clients, uh, we actually stay somewhat uh, aligned with the work that we do. And we also feel like we're not sort of cheating our staff on the promise that we made to everybody else. Because we found ourselves saying, we called ourselves a bloody greater good studio. We didn't call it like incrementally slightly better studio or like <laughs> marginally better if we feel like it. It was called greater good bloody studio. Like we made a real stink about it. So to kind of cheat ourselves on that aspect felt kind of, didn't feel quite right. So by formalizing this into this um, uh, survey, uh, we felt like we had a little clearer uh, goal as to what exactly is, what are we bumping into when our gut says no to it? And just between you and me, what we found is that if we have to go through the whole survey, we probably should have already said no, <laughs> right? Uh, so I suspect that probably, again, amongst the pissed off optimists in the room, there are probably also an internal gut check that you have. There's probably some motivating, some rigid line, some sort of, some sort of line in the sand that you've drawn about what you will or will not do. What we found is that when we share it with others, there are others that go, oh yeah, I have one of those as well. And actually, mine's a little different than yours. I would encourage you, if you do have something like that, to tell others, because I think you may find that others will join on you, join in on the same conversation, and you might feel a little less alone in it. Um, yeah, so we found that uh, by, by articulating this, this uh, gut check, we've really uh, managed to make our business a little stronger, because we found kind of intuitively, we spend so little time fielding and dealing with business development that, are, that is like a nonsense, like we eliminate a lot of the noise, and we focus on just that signal. Uh, so I'm, I'm done now. Uh, if you have any feedback for me, please let me know either this way or come up and say hi. Uh, but uh, thank you very much for having me here. In my experience, fundraising can take a lot of time, and you mentioned fundraising with your clients. Uh, does, do you ever think that that takes away from you being a designer? And what percent of your time is trying to reach out to the right foundation? Um, did everybody get to hear the question, which was like, does, it, does the effort taken to fundraise with our clients take time away from me being a designer? And what was it, how long does it take? Yeah, I mean, just what's the breakdown? Oh, my time. Um, we see that as just being an investment that's part of the business. I don't see it as being almost any other way to do it. It's been very rare for us to successfully have a project with a client that came in hot and bothered, and in under two weeks, we like landed it and, and got it. Most of those times, those calls go nowhere, and usually it's because they see us as a vendor. Um, and they want something done, like an execution, like get it done. And that's usually a really a bad, that's bad for us. Um, most of the time is six months to 12 months before a project comes in. That's, a, that's now become the pattern of our work. And we realized, I don't think we knew that going in. We thought, oh my God, like, so if I told you myself this five years ago, it was going to be 12 months before we got a project. I think that's crazy. But actually, that's how long it takes because the social sector is so driven by uh, trusted relationships that it can't, it's very hard to make a trusted relationship immediately. If anything, this is sort of a transactional project might have to come in quickly, that's small, like $5,000. And then most times, most of people, it's like a first date, you're like trying to work out if both people are legit. Mostly they're vetting us to find out like, are we, are we gonna blow it? And usually we don't. And in that 12 month cycle, we've proven ourselves to be real. We're sticking around and we are happy to help them find the funding because they have a challenge of then having to describe what we do. We have a challenge telling, telling people what it is. I can't, it'd be kind of unfair to expect a nonprofit to explain how human-centered innovation works on a regular basis. So we often might go in on a bid together to help describe what we do. So I might spend 30% of my time just doing that work. My, my role is different because I'm the co-founder, so I feel like that's a natural expectation. Um, so about a third of the business is spent doing, in my time, doing that kind of work. Um, actually, can we go here? Yes, hi. I really like the distinction you made between adding capacity and building capacity. Can you give some advice on training or teaching organizations you work with, or a story from when you build capacity? Sure, sure. Um, so I didn't even know the term adding. I didn't understand what capacity building meant. It was a completely alien term to me before I joined the social sector. It was just, I, I'd never heard of that term. Um, what it means for a lot of organizations in the nonprofit sector or sort of social sector means that they have to have almost literally a body to do the thing that they said they were gonna do. If they don't have that body, they do not have capacity. They are under capacity uh, to do that task. 
and usually because they've told a funder that they will go do that work. So when we come to them and say, hey, you want to spend X amount of dollars on an innovation project, they're like, what are you talking about? We don't barely have enough people to do the thing we said we are going to do, let alone this other thing. You're crazy. So in many ways, if our work is available, if there's a really clear need for doing work, uh, we have these two options. Do you have time in many ways? Do you have somebody that can be dedicated to doing this project? If you do, you could save a lot of money by just having us train you to do that. So our ability as a teacher to teach design, I think, is really key. I find teaching way harder than consulting, but it's a very, very efficient way of getting work done because I can teach you in, in a few hours what would have taken me and the team those same number of hours but with a much higher billable rate. Alternatively, if you do not have the time but have maybe have funding, we can do that work for you. Ooh, that's so cool. Um, oh, it's, it's, really, it's, now it's, very, it's a sexy Q&A. Oh, come on, that was really great. Okay, fine. Um, <laughs> We can add that capacity by being available as bodies, but then we have to have, we have, to have sort of funding and a support mechanism for that work. Uh, so maybe an example I can give is that we worked with a, a fantastic foundation, um, a private foundation out in Denver called the DK Foundation, Donald K. And they came to us initially looking for uh, training, actually like a short project that involved some training. Then six months later, almost a year, we went and back and did a second project that was just exclusively coaching. They had very little budget, but they had lots of time, and they had the ability to kind of do it, do a lot of the execution. They were also a really high capacity client. And then just recently, a third project altogether, they had extra funding they didn't know. They had almost like they found it in the back of the couch. They were very surprised to find this funding, didn't have the capacity to do it. So they said, hey, hey uh, Georgian Studio, can you guys go and do the design work we need? So that's rare, but I'd say it might be a trend we're going to see more of where uh, social sector clients will need, I think, one of two kinds of capacity to be delivered, either generated and grown from scratch in the people they already have, or to provide it uh, as an additional piece. And I'd say I would much prefer to grow it than to add it, because adding it is a very temporary, it's a nice thing to have, it's a very temporary effect. If you can really grow uh, the ability for a team to do the work for themselves, we would be over the moon. I'd, be, I'd love that if I never have to be working uh, uh, to be needed at all. Uh, but in many cases, that it's not an option of their choice. It's just, do they have staff to be able to do that kind of work? Thank you for the question. Uh, hi. So groups that work for the greater good obviously have a lot of ideas about how to do so. Have you ever had any tension among potential clients, or for example, I'm not sure if I totally know the example. Do you, do you have an example of what you're talking about? Um, like a client? For example, if Group B is interested in working with you, but then they find out you work with Group A, and they oh. group a compromise from it, that's, that's so interesting. As in one nonprofit um, has some, is there a potential tension working with one nonprofit? because they are either working in the same sector or same group of vulnerable children or vulnerable people as this other nonprofit. What's kind of awesome about the social sector is we don't have those kinds of beef. Okay, in the commercial sector, people are all pissy about you working with one group or another. And in fact, in some relationships, like IDEO, we would do work for Intel, let's say. And I no longer work there, so I don't care about telling people this. It was completely black ops. No one ever, ever was supposed to know about their work because Intel could not reveal the fact that they couldn't do their own design work. <laughs> okay, it would look bad. Whereas, if a uh, sports nonprofit that was doing youth training um, with high schoolers worked with Greater Good Studio, and then another youth sports group worked with Greater Good Studio, I think we found everyone's really kind of cool with it. Everyone's pretty happy because the goal isn't about being exclusively market marketplace crushing, you know, profits. It's about, in those cases, serving young youth and probably um, getting them more centered in their lives through sports. So in both cases, because they have a mission, which is why we say we work with mission-based companies, the mission alleviates that tension. It, it's like everyone's on a lovely date. Nobody minds dating each other because we're all in it to be, to be successful. I found that to be such a radical difference in how I talk about the work. And all of our studio work is all out and open. There's no confidential, very, very rarely any confidentiality rules. Everyone's really nice. Have you ever noticed that people in the social sector are like lovely? Yeah. Uh, so it, it just it doesn't engender that kind of weirdness that I'm kind of, kind of glad to say I don't see any, much anymore. Thank you for the question, though. Uh, in the back, there was a gentleman. Uh, so with getting funding, do you guys uh, work with clients who don't uh, have 
have any chance of, like, zero percent chance of making any money? Um, what's an example of that? Because I don't know if I know one. So, so it's like a private market is basically, uh, <coughs> basically plotting parking tickets. So I would, I would potentially want to work with you, uh, but I have no interest in making money off. Like I really have no interest in making money off of it. Uh -huh. Sure, sure. No, I mean, that, but I think there were mechanisms that would appreciate that difference. I don't. I think the very definition of non-profit is that they are there to support a mission, a value that that would be to society, as opposed to for you to have some fiduciary responsibility to to stakeholders who currently you don't have. Um, I think the way that non-profit world works right now, where there's money left over from a foundation, money left over from a large corporation, all of that funnels towards this kind of work. The only thing that we would require is eventually working out how to make an efficient use of our time to serve you properly based upon a set of rates that we have, which is all based on time and materials. Um, so you having to make money is not the point at all, but finding funding for some help would, would, be, would, be, would make this work. Uh, there is another talk that I'm gonna be giving at AIGA in a few weeks for Design Week, which is around the thought around a social sector economy where the role that we have as a design studio is one of only a few examples right now that I think is unfortunately rare, but in five to 10 years will become a lot more obvious to everyone. Well, there'll be 10 studios like ours, which is very issue agnostic, and then hundreds of firms that will be out there that are very issue specific. I see that happening inevitably. Uh, so in a few years, I think you'll have a lot more options. So don't just imagine that we're the only option in town. You, you're gonna be all set. Uh, yeah, hello. Could you maybe talk about some of the principles um, that you follow in terms of uh, the design thinking? Sure, I can be brief. Uh, design thinking and human-centered design is like a whole bloody, that's a, that's a whole to-do, um, and then you will see everyone who will tell you different things. I find it very simple to talk about, and I try to use the, I try not to use the word design at all. Um, what do you do, by the way? What's your, what's your regular practice? Um, building investment tools for people. Okay, so let's say we take that example. Um, I'll meet with someone who may not have a really uh, clear impression of what design might be, and I might describe that the work that you do right now is very akin to what we do. Um, when you build something, is there a moment where you might do something as an experiment? Like you might try, it, try an idea. Uh, we do that a lot. Um, if you, let's say, find out that the experiment works, what do you do next? Try another, variation. Try another variation. So that kind of like idea of like iterating and doing a multiple tests, we have a lot of experience in doing that. We happen to call it prototyping. Um, when you originally started the, the need that you found of, what you, of, of why you started your business, um, what, what did you use to find out what the need was? Um, did you see like a gap? Did you find that there was like an opportunity? Yeah, there's like a massive difference between what people need and uh, the demand for something versus what actually is the market and Perfect. We do that too, but we do it by looking at people uh, and the behaviors that they have. And we do it by watching people as they go about their daily lives, usually in context. So if it's someone who's maybe doing like a retirement saving, I think somebody was telling me they do retirement savings, watching people as they think about retirement is something that doesn't happen on a regular basis. It probably happens randomly on a Sunday when they have nothing else better to do because it's boring. I'm sorry, it, it's boring, okay? Um, if that happens in that way, I'd like to be there to watch them as they do think about those things and also think about sort of, as they think about all their future projections. As we see people with those behaviors, we come up with opportunities that you spotted. And then we respond by making stuff just like you did. So that's generally the principles by which we work by. We see what, how messy real life is and then we do a bunch of experimentation based upon what we saw. That's kind of what we think design is. Is that, is that clear? Awesome. Um, Alex. I think the bit where you are training people to do the design work and grow that capacity themselves is really beautiful. I'm curious, have you have your clients ever come back and said, hey, here's this project that we built based on what you taught us, <coughs> kind of like part of your portfolio, even though you didn't actually touch it yet? You know what I'm saying? That's so sneaky. I've never thought of that. Um, <laughs> we haven't had that many people come to us like that. Um, Man, we should root that out. That's a brilliant, brilliant story. Um, I wish I was able to tell you that right now that we could do that. 
Uh, we can certainly follow up with a few of them. I think there is uh, probably Infinity Teach is probably the best example where we gave them an initial set of wireframes and some design work, but now they're off and running. They're like going crazy now. So we could attribute some of our some of their success to us, but like in a really tangential way. Um, I haven't had anybody come back to us with a with a success story like that yet. Um, but I do think it may, may pay off. We've had students of ours who started their own social businesses and they have maybe been flourishing. Um, but I think, you know, as a teacher, I think you hope that there will be a, a poster child student one day that comes back to you and say, hey, you really uh, made an impression on me and uh, have this um, uh, oh, captain, my captain type of moment with, with your student. You hope so. Um, but I don't know if, if we've had enough time yet, but um, I'll let you know when we, when we do. I keep ignoring you. Sorry, go ahead. Um, you mentioned in your talk about how there's this tendency among nonprofits or social services to kind of place at the bars usually set pretty low as when it comes to like quality of work. And some of that may be uncertainty or maybe they're not as like technic technically literate. Um, how do you guys <coughs> try to like mitigate that as part of like the training and education also like teaching them like what what's good in the land in like the landscape or mm -hmm. like how to like expect better code from people that they pay to write code from for them? Um, I don't think it's going to be easy. I don't think we can just say, you know what, this sucks. Because it's kind of insulting, I think, to tell people if perhaps something's not been that great. I don't know if it sets you off on the right tone. Um, I think generally the idea is just to be really consistent by what you think is good is, and then to be explicit about it when you, you describe it. Um, so there's a benchmarking process that we might go through where we gather the very best things we've seen, whether it's in design or whether it's in code or back end or whatever it might be, and describe those aspects to say, and tell people like a good teacher would, why you think it's good. Not just say something's inherently good and something's inherently bad, but why. And I think that your internal logic or your internal rubric for what that will make something good is probably very opaque to most people. Um, so if you have an opportunity to work with a client, describing what you internally use as your gut check for what good is out loud would only, not only, I think, uh, impress upon them what, what values you have, but also do a little bit of contribution towards them being educated. I don't think that one conversation is going to make the difference. Um, but I think it will probably be attributed to lots of conversations like it. So I would always say, speak out loud what you're thinking and what's saying in your gut, because then others will start to share. And if they have, they could disagree, that's fine. But at least they knew what the, what's going on inside uh, your, your gut, as it were. Hello, back there, hi. What do you do about uh, uh, maintenance and Because your work is largely, uh, largely foundation funded and those are often so what do you, I mean, I know you're younger studio, but how do you work out recurring maintenance costs for you know, three, four years after the initial grant is all spent? So the uh, initial relationships and initial discussions describe certainly um, understanding sort of what the research and design components might be that we would do. But then the discussions with the developer, since we don't have any developers in-house, um, usually it's a little separate, but it described at the very early outset that there will be some maintenance agreement has to be in place. Otherwise, you'll have this shiny new thing that will either break or will look incredibly old very, very quickly. Um, some companies and some organizations are happy to have that conversation. Not everybody knows to do that. I think one of the challenges for funders is that they're used to buying stuff. They're used to getting a widget. And the idea that there's a process that might produce a widget um, is, I think, can be kind of tough for people to wrap their heads around. Uh, so the maintenance of that thing that you've been looking for um, isn't the easiest conversation because they could be sort of surprised by like, it costs that much to maintain it? What the hell am I buying it for? Um, it's not often the conversation that we necessarily have every day though because I think the developers have a lot more um, technical expertise to explain what the breakdown of those costs might be. Uh, but I know that we, we do try to flag that at the very beginning of our, of our conversations with our clients and then usually with a funder later on. So it's not a satisfying answer, I'm sorry. Um, but usually the developers that we work with have a lot, much more technical expertise to be able to explain why and, and what that would look like. I, I think you should be in the room if, if we did it next. Any other, are we done? Derek, are you yeah, cutting me off? Okay. Thank you so much, guys. <laughs>